To those of you who are watching online, we'll be watching tomorrow night. We want to say hello to you and thank you for joining us. Um, again, we want to thank Second Pres. I know some of you will be meeting there tomorrow night. We're really grateful to that church. One, we've had a partnership that's gone literally for decades there. I think we're on 40 years now. And they are very gracious. You know, they're closed on a couple of holidays throughout the year, but they're gracious in just letting us move our night to Tuesday night. And while we know that changes people's schedule, man, it is a blessing because to try and find another church to get to on Monday night is not an easy thing. So as always, we're grateful to Second Pres for, for their graciousness to us. Um, I don't know what your Monday or Tuesday night has been like. We were sharing before we started recording that it's it's been a little rough trying to get here. So um, it's a good thing to kind of pause and remember that we need to remain, uh, remain in our vine. So let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord now in, in prayer just to remember that. So, And Heavenly Father, we, we do want to come before you now with, with those words upon our heart, Lord, that we need to remain. Um, God, it takes things sometimes like bad traffic, or maybe sometimes it's things much more serious than that. Um, really bad news at work, uh, a really significant health diagnosis. There's so many things, Lord, that really cause us to stop, and they, they remind us we need to remain. And so, God, as we come now, we want to be in that spirit, a spirit where we are remaining, where we are coming and attaching ourselves to you. Um, and so, Lord, we just ask that for these next several minutes, that uh, you would allow us to do that. Lord, that we'll be cognizant no matter where we are, maybe we're listening to this stuck in traffic, but Lord, wherever we are, that we would remain. God, I ask that um, as the speaker, that I would be emptied of self, that I would be filled with your spirit to speak the words that need to be spoken. And here in this room and for those that are listening, God, that in the ways that only you can, you would use technology and the gifts you've given us so that these words would touch hearts that are ready to receive them. And for all of us that might have things that are going on, Lord, we ask that we bring those with us. Not that we set them aside and pretend they don't exist, but we bring them to you and ask that you speak your truth into them now. God, we ask these things because only you can do them. And because apart from you, as you tell us this evening, we can do nothing. And so we submit ourselves to you now, ask these things in your glorious name. Amen. So many years ago, when I first started working in Indianapolis, my commute was from Evansville. My week would begin on Sunday night. I would drive up to my mom and dad's house who lived in Terre Haute. I would spend the night in their house. I would wake up early around six so I could get up and drive about the hour and 20 minutes to the jail that I worked at in Indianapolis. I would drive back to Terre Haute Monday night, Tuesday morning, wake up and do the same thing. Tuesday night, I would drive from Indianapolis down to Evansville because I didn't work on Wednesdays. That was a chance to be with my family. Wednesday night, I would drive up to Terre Haute. Thursday morning, drive from Terre Haute to Indy. Thursday night, Indy to Terre Haute. Friday, same thing. And then I would drive back home to Evansville on Friday night. There were a lot of reasons for that. Some of that was I was coming out of a time where I was getting my life back in order. And so that was what we needed to do then. That was a lot of driving, and it was hard to do. So hard that in February, I stopped going to my mom and dad's house, and what I would do is that I'd had to wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning, Evansville time, because there's an hour time difference. I would drive three hours from Evansville up to Indianapolis, and I would do that whole cycle. Um, it was exhausting. And I remember the, the night when I called my wife uh, because the company that I worked with had approached me. and At that time, I was only working 32 hours a week, um, and they had approached me and said, we want you to come five days a week. That extra day was going to be enough money that we would be able to put our house up for sale, get a rental, and we'd be able to be together again as a family. We had done that for a year. We started in September of 05. At September of 06, we moved up to Evansville uh, together again as, as a family. And when I shared that news with my wife that night on the phone, I remember uh, we both cried. Because there was a lot of reasons why I had to do that. There was fear, there was desperation, and there was the need that I had to provide for my family. So I had something that motivated me, but the thing is, is that whether it's fear, desperation, the need to provide for your loved ones, that source of energy can only last for so long. There needs to be something deeper that drives us, something that sustains us in our darkest times. If not, then eventually 
we are going to collapse under the weight of whatever that source is because it won't be enough. See, there's only one source that is able to sustain us through the darkest of times, and really not even the darkest of times. There's only one source that's going to be able to sustain us through life, because life is hard. And whether it be you're trying to get your life back together, where you're trying to fulfill a family burden that you feel has been placed on your shoulders, or maybe you're trying to realize a dream that you have had since you were young, all of those things can be a source of energy that can carry us a long way in life. But eventually, eventually, whatever energy they supply, it will leave us, and we, it will leave us depleted. See, Jesus recognized the truth that there must be more that sustains us, more that drives us, more that replenishes us than what is temporal. Only He can provide what is needed to face life and meet the challenges that we face. As He speaks with His disciples, we read of how only by remaining in Him, only by remaining in Him can we bear the fruit that will allow us to obtain the crowns that one day we get to lay at His feet. And so the passage tonight is divided into two parts. We have John 15, 1 through 17, the vine and the need of the branches. That's the vine and the need of the branches. And then we have John 15, 18 through 25, the vine and the hatred of the world. That's the vine and the hatred of the world. Now, as we open this chapter, there's, there can be some discussion about, okay, where is this discourse taking place? Because at the end of chapter 14, Jesus says, come now, let us leave. Scholars seem to be pretty much in agreement that this is called the upper room discourse. And so it is happening in the upper room. And it's not really happening along the road. Most scholars agree this is taking place still in the upper room. So chapter six, uh, 15 opens with the final of the I am statements in the book of John. There are seven of them. And Jesus gives his final one here, where he says, I am the true vine. Now, as we know with Jesus, none of his words are random. He always picks his words carefully, and that's true here as well. See, both Isaiah and Jeremiah had recorded in their writings references to Israel being a vine. Isaiah wrote that the house of Israel was the vineyard of the Lord Almighty. The men of Judah were the garden of his delight. However, Isaiah also writes that God had planted them looking for justice, but instead he had found bloodshed. He looked for righteousness, but instead he found cries of distress. Israel was meant to draw other nations to the one true God, but instead, Jeremiah writes, they had become corrupt, a corrupt wild vine. And this is significant imagery. And again, this is something the disciples would have been familiar with. So when Jesus says, I am the true vine, he is setting himself apart. He is making a statement about his lordship and being the righteous representative of God on earth that Israel had failed to be. Now, the second part of verse 1 is significant as well. See, a gardener must tend to a vine to allow that vine to be all that it is to be. And the father was that gardener with Jesus. And Jesus shows this and had been showing this in an amazing and beautiful way. What we see as we go through the rest of this passage is what Jesus is doing is he is actually inviting the disciples and those who believe in him to enjoy the same type of relationship that he has with his father. See, the father had sustained Jesus and he would sustain Jesus in the darkest hours of Jesus' life that were yet to come. Jesus would sustain the disciples through the helper that he had promised them in chapter 14. He would sustain them just as the father had sustained him. And as we read verse 2, it can be a little jarring. It says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. Well, what is Jesus saying here? Scholars agree what Jesus is not saying is that a person can lose their salvation. There's too much that, one, we can look at just in the book of John alone. But in the whole of Scripture, there's too much we can see that says that that really isn't what would be being said here. Many theologians suggest that verse 3, 2 and verse 6 can be tied together. Branches that bear no fruit in a tree ultimately can cause harm. They can help breed disease, they can bring in insects, and so the tree can be harmed and therefore those branches need to be removed. This is what the gardener does. This is what the father does. Dead branches cannot be used for building. They're really only good for burning and therefore they must be cut away. 
Verse 2 also lets us know that even the healthy branches still will get some pruning. There are parts of our lives that are dead and they need cut away. There are other aspects of our life that are not inherently bad. They're not inherently evil. But at times, God is going to prune those away and he, he will even cut into those areas. And this is done not to harm us. Rather, as the expert gardener, God will prune and he will cut those areas because he knows that at times something that appears healthy to us might need to be cut back so that something even greater in abundance and greater in health will be allowed to grow in its place. Now, is this fun or is it enjoyable? Not at all. But it will produce the fruit that Jesus talks about in the coming verses. And we see in verse 3, Something that our questions had us look at this week. It's a reference to being cleaned already. Now, if we think of the example that Jesus showed when he washed his disciples' feet in chapter 13, and we combine that with what he is saying here in the reference to the pruning of the branches, it helps us develop a picture of what Jesus is saying. The belief that Jesus was and is the Son of God, was the Messiah, and pays for our sins with his death, that is the initial cleansing. The washing of feet as an example of humility of service and the pruning of aspects of our lives that will occur show the continuing refining of our walk with Him. We are continually being shaped. We are continually being pruned by the one who has washed us. Now beginning in verse 4 and over the next several verses, really through about verse 11, there's a key word. That word is remain. Some translations will have that word as abide. So what does that word mean? As you look at that word in the Greek and Hebrew, in its most absolute sense, that word means to continue in perpetuity. Okay, well then what's that mean? The word perpetual means that it is ongoing. It means it is really to be forever. It is everlasting. So when we remain in Christ, when we abide in Christ, that means it is a continual state. It never stops. It means that we never stop remaining. It means in every aspect of our life, we're to continually be going back and remember that we are attached. We have to remain. We have to continue with Him in every aspect of our life. Jesus says that as we look at Him in in verse 4 where He says, You must remain in Me. I must remain in you. You cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. Without me, without remaining, you can do nothing. Those are strong words. That means, as I said, we are continually, we are to be continually attached to the vine. We continue with him forever. Our remaining is to be everlasting. It doesn't mean that it's just now or something that we're going to do in heaven. It means that in every aspect of our lives currently, He is to be our source. He is to be our motivation. We are always to be coming back to Him in everything. How we love, how we work, how we serve, how we lead. We are to be attached. We are to remain in Him. There is no aspect of our life that we are to look at and to say, no, I'm good here. This is an area where I don't need to remain in Him. We are to remain, we are to be attached to Him in everything, because if not, then we are told by Him, we can do nothing. Does that mean that we won't be successful? No, that's not what it means. But what it does mean is that whatever we are doing that is not attached to Him, whatever we are doing that is of our own source, that is of our own attempt to bear fruit, that will, in truth, that's only going to lead to a dead branch. A branch that He tells us in verse 6, is only good to be burned. So let's look at the progression of fruit that we see. If we go in verse 2, first we see there is no fruit. But then in that same verse, we are told there's to be more fruit. And finally, in verse 5, there is to be much fruit. Theologians remind us fruit doesn't simply refer to good deeds because John interconnects fruit and life. A redeemed life is a fruitful life. It simply is impossible unless we remain, unless we abide, unless we stay attached to the true vine. Now, these initial verses can provide a little bit of angst as we examine and we think about cut off branches and burned branches. The words of one theologian, however, give a great summation of what we are to take from this passage. He writes, Do not take more from the image than, is, than its intended purpose. 
This is a positive exhortation to fearful men, not a dreadful warning of awful potential. These are cleansed men. Remember, Jesus is speaking these words of comfort because he knows what is coming. The disciples don't. So what he is telling them is words of comfort so that when the bad times come for them, they can remember his words. Well, then what are we to make of verse 7? As we read verse 7, it says, If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. So is this our free pass? Does this mean that we can go to him and we can ask for anything, for material possessions, for wealth and for comfort? When we read this verse, we need to note that there is a condition. And that condition is laid out in the first part of the verse. If we remain in him, we must first be attached. We must continually be going back to him and having his words remain in us. As we do this, we find that the words of Jesus become our words. And therefore, what we ask is going to be more of and from him than of and from ourselves. Verse 8 adds to this truth. What we ask in his name that we receive will be to the Father's glory, not our own comfort. As we remain, as we are attached and continually going back to him, we receive from him and what we receive gives glory to the Father, showing us to be his disciples. What is the mark of a disciple? How is it that we are to be known to be his that we were told by Jesus earlier? It is by our love. So let us ask for that in his name, that we may love as he loved, and in so doing, we may glorify our Father, for he is worthy of that glory. Now, as we noted, the Father had sustained and would sustain Jesus, and Jesus is informing his disciples in verse 9 that what they are to remain in. They are to remain in his love. The Father has loved Jesus. Jesus has loved the disciples, and now they are to remain. Now they are to abide. Now they are to live. They are to continually perpetually be in that love. Now, that love is not something that we just do. The love is what we reflect, denotes, and shows the character of God. So, remaining in Christ and His love certainly seems like the best route for us to take. So, how do we do that? The answer is found in verse 11, and the answer might be a little surprising. The answer is by obedience. Now, that we need to obey probably isn't surprising, but what might be surprising is the benefit that is received from obedience. Often, it seems that obedience can be talked about within the church more in a sense of avoiding a negative, such as, we need to do this or else. Here, though, Jesus is teaching us to obey, and because, not because of what we avoid, but because of what we get to enjoy. We enjoy remaining in Him. Because when we remain in Him, the peace that He gives, the strength that He gives, the love, the compassion, the mercy, the presence that He gives, all of those things are received by obeying. Obedience is what has us remain. Jesus speaks to how He experienced this in obeying His Father. His obeying His Father allowed Him to remain in His Father's love. And by doing so, He has been sustained by His Father, and He will be sustained by His Father as He goes to the cross because of His obedience. Further benefit is seen later in verse 11. He shares this. He shares this truth with us so that His joy is in us. Now think about that. As we obey, our joy is complete. The joy of Jesus is in us as we obey. This is by obedience, and that obedience leads to joy. But not just any joy. This is a complete joy, a full joy. We don't obey because of what we may lose. We obey because of what we receive. And so what's his command? What's his command that we are to obey? Jesus tells us in verse 12, is to love one another as he loved us. How has he loved us? He has loved us sacrificially. Our needs were paramount to him, and he provided what only he could, what he could provide to meet that need. So are we to die on a cross? Very likely, most likely, no. Especially not in the way that Jesus did. Only Jesus can die on a cross for the sacrifice and the forgiveness of sins. But each day, we can learn to die to self. So as we do, we can, and as we remain in him, we will. In verse 14, 
Jesus speaks incredible words as he's been speaking all through this passage. What he tells us is that we are his friends. Now, one theologian had talked about the beauty of these two images, the images of branches and the image of friends. With each, there are privileges and responsibilities associated. See, as branches, we have the privilege of sharing his life and the responsibility of abiding in him. As friends, we have the privilege of knowing him and we have the responsibility of obedience. Do we realize what a blessing it is to know Jesus? the one who holds all things together, the author and the, perfect, and the perfecter of our faith has called us friends. He has let us know his business, as he says in verse 15. He has shared with us what his father has made known to him. As we get to verse 16, one theologian tells us there is so much that he has packed into verse 16, and that same theologian unpacks it very well. It reminds us, verse 16 does, of the entire theme of the Bible. God sought out mankind. Mankind has not sought out God. Being found by God, we were then appointed. We were then assigned to go and to bear fruit. And it's interesting. This is not an option that is given. Rather, it's a purpose that is expected that we bear fruit. We bear fruit, as one scholar reminds us, by, glor by glorifying God, by displaying His character. We display his character by going and asking him through prayer how we might be able to show his character to the world in which he has placed us. Jesus concludes this first section by reminding us of his command to love one another. Love, as we noted, is how the world will recognize that we belong to him. Love also is the hallmark of God to the world. He loved the world enough to send his own son, and he loves his children enough to indwell them with his Holy Spirit. This is what we are to ask for, the ability to love one another. And we come to the first principle. Abiding obedience produces the recognizable fruit of God's love. Abiding obedience produces the recognizable fruit of God's love. So there are two questions that we need to answer tonight. The first and the most important is, are you already clean? We can come to a Bible study and everyone might assume that because we're here that a belief in Jesus has been recognized or has been proclaimed. But is that the case for you tonight? As you listen to the words of Jesus, is he asking tonight become the night? that you are made clean? Do you need to be washed by his words, words that are truth and words that give eternal life? If you do not know if you are clean, would you be willing to speak with your group leader or be willing to talk with me after class some night so that you can know that you are clean and made clean not just by the words of Jesus, but by the blood of Jesus? The second question is for those who have been made clean. Jesus stated that we remain in him by obeying. So how are we doing with that? And that is not to imply in any way, shape, or form that we gain anything, that we gain our salvation or earn our salvation because that we earn the blood that he shed for us. Rather, it's a point to stop and to check ourselves. Are we remaining? Are we obeying? Are we continuing in Him perpetually in every aspect of our life, even what we might find simple, such as sitting in traffic for way too long? Are we going back to Him and remembering that we are attached to Him? In all that we do, we need to be going back to Him. We need to remain attached to Him. It's like attending a bride. My daughter got married just a couple of months ago, and as the father of the bride, I had a different perspective than on other weddings that I've been to. What I noticed was that the entire attention was on her with everyone, with the bridesmaids and all that they did. They wanted to make sure, does she need coffee? Does she need food? Does she need water? Is her hair okay? Does she have everything that she needs? Are her shoes okay? Is the makeup good? What more can I do to make sure the bride looks as good as she can on her day? Well, who's the bride of Christ? It's the church. The church is what Christ has founded with his blood and with his disciples. So what are we doing to help that bride look as beautiful as she can be so on that day when she is presented to her groom, 
she is the most radiant that she will ever be. We don't remain attached so that we can earn anything. We are to remain attached because otherwise we can do nothing. Are we experiencing the joy that Jesus speaks of here? A joy that is only complete when we remain. We are constantly going back to the only source that gives joy and provides perfect love. Because when we are there, then we bear his fruit. Now, the joy that Jesus speaks of here and the promises that are received as we remain in him, they're uplifting and they're encouraging. But Jesus gives a word of caution to the disciples and to us in the final section. The world is not receptive to this message that Jesus gives. Our notes do a great job of defining world. Simply put, is the world is those who ignore God. Jesus warns the disciples that if they are hated, they first must remember that the world hated Jesus. We do not belong to the world. Those who follow Christ belong to him. They do not belong to the world. Because we have been chosen out of the world, we will be hated by the world. He reminds them and us in verse 20 that the servant should not be expected to be treated differently than the master. It's odd as we look at verse 21, it really provides a type of encouragement. We are hated, not because of us, but because of his name. It is their reaction, it is their rejection of Jesus that provides the fuel for their hate from the world. They, who would be the leaders of the day with Jesus, and for us, those who ignore God, they hated him and they hate us because they don't know the one who sent Jesus. They don't know him because they were unwilling, they're not willing to believe. And today it's the same. In verse 22, Jesus makes clear he has exposed their guilt. He has exposed their wrong, their sin. And in doing so, he has revealed their blemishes. He has laid bare that as they are, they are not acceptable to God. Now that's not a fun thing to hear, but it is the truth. It is also true that Jesus, through his words and signs to them, showed how they could be placed back in right standing with God. Yet they rejected that. And people today reject Jesus, and they hate those who bring his message for the same reason. Because Jesus exposes and reveals that we are broken, and that we are in need of redemption. Jesus ends this section with a quote from Psalm 69. They hate me without reason. Now this same chapter of Psalms has been quoted in chapter 2 of John's account, and we're going to see it again in chapter 19 of his account. Each occurrence of this psalm is used in reference to Jesus' suffering and death. And again, Jesus is offering proof that he is the fulfillment of the word of God by using this. See, there is a single scarlet thread that runs all through Scripture. Jesus is that scarlet thread. He is the message of Scripture. Then we come to the second principle. Rebellious humanity hates redeemed humanity. Rebellious humanity hates redeemed humanity. Jesus healed the sick. He made the lame to walk. He made the blind to see. He even raised the dead. But what do we read that he was called? He was called worse than a Samaritan. He was just the carpenter's son of Mary and Joseph. He was a blasphemer. He was a demoniac. He was even at times called the devil himself. So are we to be surprised when today we are called old-fashioned, out of touch, dumb, ignorant, ridiculous? Yet, what was the response of Jesus when they threw those names at him? He knew when to respond and when to be silent. Would we not benefit in asking for that same type of wisdom? It can be difficult to be hated, and it's not fun. But look at how Jesus responded to that. For three years, he dialogued with those who he knew eventually were going to kill him. The night of his betrayal, he washed the feet of the one who was going to betray him. And later, when they nailed him to a cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they do. Is that our prayer when we're hated? Now, this Saturday, one of our leaders shared an incredible verse as we were answering our questions. And one of the final questions was, how are we to interact with the world? And this verse comes from the book of Jude, which is right before Revelation. And in verses 22 and 23, and these verses read, Be merciful to those who doubt. Snatch others from the fire and save them. That's an incredible picture. 
maybe we would do well to remember that Jesus said earlier that he chose us. We did not choose him. All of us were at one time in our lives literally playing with fire. It is only by his great mercy and his great love that we are now one of his branches and as he calls us, his friends. How might we be different if instead of seeing words of hate and actions of hatred, we instead saw the flames of judgment that were burning behind those who write, speak, and act on their hatred? Perhaps we could do as Jude writes and show mercy better yet. Perhaps it is in those spaces and places that we most need to bear the fruit of the love of God. Or is he not worthy? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for having these words recorded. God, it is such a beautiful, intimate picture of what Jesus is sharing with his disciples and that you have preserved that for us. God, it just shows how alive your word still is, that it's still relevant today because so much of it resonates. And God, it can be easy to focus on the hatred of the world and the rejection that we face. But God, let us remember the creator of the universe, the one who has died for us, has called us friends. Lord, let that help us remain in him through our obedience. And again, not to obey because of what we're afraid we're going to lose. Let us obey because of the joy that we receive. And let us show the world how wonderful it is to be attached to the, to the true vine because you never run out of love. You never run out of strength. You never run out of mercy, compassion. And God, we need all those things. So God, let us remain attached so we can go out and give those things to a world that so desperately, desperately needs all those. We ask these things in your righteous holy name. Amen.